One year old woman is living the final hours of her life tonight, barring a real last minute re re reprieve. Teresa Lewis, who's said to have an IQ of only around 70, will get a lethal injection in Virginia tomorrow for hiring two men to kill her husband and stepson. She will become only, only, the twelfth woman to be executed since America reintroduced the death penalty in 1976. In Texas, there could soon be a 13th woman facing lethal injection, and she's British. Her name is Linda Carty, and her lawyers and the British government say her original trial was so seriously flawed, they want a retrial. Peter Marshall reports now from Texas. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. That saved a wretch like me. Death Row, Texas, a state with America's busiest execution chamber. Since the death penalty was restored, Texas has put to death 462 people. Only three were women. This is the women's death row. I was blind. But now I see. Next in line for the lethal injection, Linda Carty. It's the song that keeps me, how should I put it, sane. Keeps a smile on my and hope in my heart. What's life like in here? Hellish. It's a nightmare. It's basically a place that you don't want to be in that no one should be. Sometimes you hope that you could just blink and it would all go away. But it's also a reality of um, the situation, the dire situation that I'm in, in what I'm facing. The crime happened in a Houston suburb nearly 10 years ago. The details are disputed, but it's agreed three armed men gathered outside this apartment complex where Linda Carty was living and burst in on a neighboring family. This is what the prosecution say happened next. Demanding money and drugs, the men pistol whipped the apartment's tenant and his cousin and then took a telephone call from Linda Carty, who it's alleged was commanding the operation. At this, they abducted the man's wife and her four-day-old baby. The scene shifts to the following day, 20 miles across the city to a house that's now a shambles. Back then, it was said to have been the gang's headquarters. This was the driveway of the house, and 16 hours after the abduction, two cars were found here. In one, the air conditioning was running, and on the back seat was the baby alive and well. In the other, in the boot, was the mother. She'd been suffocated. The prosecution claimed that to save her failing marriage, Linda Carty desperately wanted a baby she'd pass off as her own. It was a fabricated story by the state, you know, because it would sound well and it would, you know, the jury would buy it. And they would think that I'm this desperate, I was this desperate a woman that couldn't have another baby and nobody really investigated the fact that I was still fertile. The state had this theory that she wanted the victim kidnapped because she was pregnant and she was going to cut open the stomach and take the baby out, which oh. is just horrendous. But then we looked at the facts and the baby had already been born the week before. There was no there was nothing, you know, to do of cutting open of the stomach. That made no sense. It made great dramatic effect for the prosecutor to sit in front of the jury with scissors and say this is what was going to happen. But in reality, you know, it was drama, which we believe was inappropriate, uh, but had no basis in reality. Linda Carty's plight's troubling on many levels. Her trial lawyer's record was, in the words of the British government, woeful. The evidence against Linda Carty was thin and inconsistent, and what there was came from drug dealers and gunmen, people who may have had good reason to dislike Linda Carty, for in her past life, 
she was a paid informant for the Drug Enforcement Agency. Linda Carty's history as an informant for the DEA is, by its nature, a cloudy one. She'd migrated to America from the Caribbean with her infant daughter in the early 80s. She says she was contacted by drug enforcement while unwittingly dating a drug dealer. The prosecution say she'd been arrested for theft. Linda Carty's daughter, Jovelle, pictured here with her mother at her graduation ceremony, says she grew up in full knowledge of the drug enforcement work. I always thought that, you know, I'm, she's got to find something else to do because this is it was stressful. Constantly worrying, worrying, you know, who might find out where we live or who we are, the rest of my mom's family, things like that, if we were ever going to be in danger. But I never actually worried that my mom would be on the opposite end. You, you knew the DEA, the handler, didn't you? Mm-hmm. Yes. Charlie Mathis. I did know Charlie Mathis. He was like family. He, I mean, I referred to him as Uncle Charlie for the years and years that my mom worked with the DEA. You knew him pretty well then? Yes, spoke to him often. He knew about everything I was doing in school, sports I was playing. And, uh, Linda Carty uh, says her undercover work against an international drug ring landed her on death row. And I think that somebody informed on me, and the person who informed on me had to be inside um, that particular group because there, was, there weren't too many people that knew what so, I was assigned to. So you say they decided to frame you? Exactly. I knew too much, and for me to survive out there would have brought the entire... Um, drug cartel down. Downtown Houston. On the 37th floor, new lawyers are now trying to save Linda Carty's life. I had the sort of view that if someone's at the stage where they've been convicted of murder, they probably did it. Uh, but they still deserved a full defense. And so I looked into this case. And once our team got into it, we were, you know, the American expression, just blown away by the fact that she did not have a fair trial. She did not have a defense put on for her. And so it changed our whole impression uh, for the whole team. What the lawyer did is One of the top witnesses for the state was a, a state officer from the Drug Enforcement Agency. And he was shocked that her lawyers never spoke to him because he was ready to testify that he knew Linda and she was not a killer. The prosecution lawyers didn't ask any questions that would have helped Linda, you say? The problem was her lawyer didn't ask any questions that would have helped Linda Carty. That's the whole key. This is Linda Carty's trial lawyer. His name is Jerry Guerino, and he has quite a reputation. Jerry Guerino specialised in death penalty cases, and he was spectacularly unsuccessful. Of 39 clients, no fewer than 20 ended up on death row. That's more than any single prosecutor can claim. Repeatedly, he's been accused of failing clients, rarely meeting some. He met Linda Carty for just 15 minutes before she went on trial for her life. Is Jerry Guerino there, please? From BBC TV, from Newsnight. We repeatedly tried to contact Jerry Guerino to talk to him about the Carty case, but he's proved elusive. On the phone, I was told he's not making no comment. So we went to his office and got nowhere. Well, Jerry Guerino is not here today, and they've told me they don't know where he can be contacted. We did speak to the key witness Jerry Guerino missed, Linda Carty's former Drug Enforcement Agency handler, Charles Mathis. He declined to appear on camera, but has said in a sworn affidavit, Linda Carty worked as a confidential informant for me, gathering information and tips and, when authorized, taking a more active role in an investigation, such as making authorized buys of narcotics. I got to know her very well. Linda also worked as a CI with the Houston Police Department. I would have testified that Linda is not a violent person, let alone a cold-blooded murderer. I do not believe Linda is capable of killing another human being. 
One further fact Jerry Guerino missed was Linda Carty's nationality. Coming from the UK Protectorate St Kitts, she's a British subject. The anti-death penalty group Reprieve are campaigning. They've set up a mock cell in Trafalgar Square, and the British consul in Texas has made Linda Carty his priority. It's the most important thing for me at the moment in my job. The British government has a policy wherever British uh, nationals overseas are uh, either facing death penalty or potentially facing death penalty of intervening uh, and trying to support them. We, we uh, oppose the death penalty wherever it is. The authorities and her defence lawyer had plenty of opportunities to identify her nationality and to tell us about it. That could have happened at arrest, it could have happened at the point where she was arraigned uh, and charged, it could have happened at the trial, it could have happened at sentencing, and it didn't. And it, I think it's, uh, it's one of the most uh, important things that we need to focus on now, the fact that she did not get the support that she needed at that time. Yeah. At this stage, so late in the day, being British could be the only lifeline. Yeah. Do you feel British? I am British. You can't wash it off. It's not something I can use soap and water to wash off. I am British. Have you always felt British in some way? I am British, and I'm always going to be British, and I'm proud to be <laughs> British. What color is that, Bruza? Uh, orange. Yellow. Yellow. All right. And I miss my daughter, and I miss my grandsons. I'm denied the privilege of seeing them. I can't hold them. I've never held them. She's more than just my mom. She's kind of like my best friend, so... I saw my mom all the time. I talked to her all the time. We talk about everything. So I, I seriously doubt that I would have been able to miss if my mom was disturbed enough to try to kidnap someone's child. I mean, it just it didn't make any sense. This case is so far from, from what anyone could even imagine possible in a death penalty situation. It's just outrageous. Like me. I want While her supporters press for a retrial, Linda Carty awaits an execution date and prays for clemency from a Texas governor who's only once in over 200 cases commuted a death sentence. I was blind, but now I see. She sings of amazing grace, but it's mercy that's required. That reporter from Peter Marshall.